Hello and welcome to the Instec London podcast. This is Matthew Grant, one of the partners from Instec London. Uh, in this episode, we're delighted to bring you three more discussions from our recent event on the 2nd of April, MGA's The Next Frontier for InsureTech. And you're going to hear from EquipsMe, Genesis, Descartes, Archipelago uh, and Exceedance. Uh, and you can learn more about the event and see what we got up to from our website www.instec.london and look out for the final section of the discussions we had on our next podcast. Now we have um, Matthew who has his own um, startup, uh, equips me, uh, and Genesis in the shape of Andre who's um, their tech provider. Matthew, what does equips me do? Uh, we provide health insurance for UK business, basically. Uh, that's simple enough. Where are you in the process? Uh, behind the Tate Modern. Um, <laughs> and uh, we've just finished UAT or renewals. Oh, so, so we're into our second year of trading, which reduces our odds to survive by about 45%, apparently. Uh, and what's your distribution model? Multi-channel. So you go direct and the broker... And are you, what, what's the split, split after one year? Um, well, our plan A was brokers. Um, and as I said to the team before we spun out, there'll be something that comes from left field, Plan Z, um, which probably eclipses Plan A. Um, brokers, I've been a broker, can I say, so I can say this, are pretty slow. Um, and so we've got some interesting things going on in Plan Z, which have kind of opened our eyes that we never thought about. And ACTS are the only capacity? Um, they are them? the only insurance capacity. Um, we then have services provided by remote GP, a remote health check, and then uh, stress counselling. And, and there's a few people doing what you do. What do you, how would you make yourself special? What's the source? Uh, what's the special? Um, uh, I suppose it's a very simple product that we actually built by asking customers what they wanted. So tell me the t technology, what's involved, and uh, I think I know who built it. Uh, yeah, uh, he's built it. Yeah. Um, it's quite complicated. I think um, we do ourselves a disservice, but I mean to talk about it's simple, but to make things simple in insurance, it's incredibly complicated. Um, so we have a two-stage platform which has a company element and, and a payment engine, an individual uh, element and a payment engine, individual upgrades on both platforms. So we, you know, you're renewing an incredibly complicated thing. Um, we met these guys, we did due diligence on six platforms. Um, they won. Um, uh, but they won for many reasons, uh, one of which was they said they'd never done it before. Um, so we quite like the fact they were honest. And since then, it's been a journey. It's been a journey. Yeah, yeah a journey, <clears throat> as they say. So were you a supplier who, when asked to fill in an RFP, said they couldn't do one of the things? Because that would be a unique thing, in my view. Um, yes, but we were very honest about it from the beginning. And we said to Matthew that we think we can do it. And he trusted us on that. And what challenges did he give you that you relished so much? <laughs> As you could hear from his opening, Plan Z was already in place. So it's about the plan changing the whole time. And I think another very big important part for any startup is every client matters. And because you own a manager, there's a lot of pressure they apply onto their vendors and to their suppliers. So that was probably one of the, the challenges. And um, uh, I see this a lot. Uh, Matthew, how did you pay for this? One of the decisive moments in the due diligence process was we worked out a, a pricing scheme, which I won't embarrass Andre because you guys will all want it. Uh, we worked out a pricing scheme, and it was it basically, you know, it was, a, it was a mixture between fixed fee and an upside from our GWP. And these guys said, well, okay, well, that's fine, that will work, but at some point we will need to cap the, the GWP element because that will just hack you off. And we had other vendors that were like, well, actually, it doesn't matter, does it? Because at that point you'll be earning enough to pay us enough. It's like, that's not the attitude, actually. And so what we found with uh, Genesis and is that we've been able to talk almost transparently about where we are on our runway, how much money we've got. You know, there, there's absolutely no point in them double-charging us if we run out of money at Christmas, because then, then we're not here. So I think the flexibility of approach around pricing has been really beneficial for us, because, you know... Yeah. When, you go and up, when you go and raise money and you turn up with a fantastic pitch and you, and you pack and you're like, da da da, first thing the guys in front of you do is halve it and then probably halve it again. And they're probably right, actually. And so, you know, you've got, you've got, to, you've got to have that flexibility and that open relationship with a provider and say, look, you can charge me this, but it'll just run out quicker. 
And presumably it's a continued relationship. I mean, you're, the build goes on. You must have other things you want to do. Yeah, we are just finished UAT on renewals. We are UAT on the API feed, which um, allows us to put our product on other people's platforms. Um, we've got two more products in development. Yep. So by October, we'll be able to ensure every business in the UK. And it just, just keeps on going. Oh, well done, you. OK, uh, we've got some time for some uh, Q&A. Hello. Um, so you said that the time to delivery was three months. How many people were involved in that build? So on Matthew's team, what we had was a stakeholder representing us in the organization being his ops director, which was pivotal. So it was effectively one ops director within the organization with a couple of their staff doing the UAT and some of the specifications. And we've got a substantial team back in South Africa, but I think our delivery team for that project was about seven staff. Andre, um, I'm a big fan of the Genesis pl platform, obviously. Um, why are people still buying Glidewire? How are you getting your, your brand across to the market? I think possibly it is um, career management. You know, uh, don't no, get, you, don't, don't get sacked. you don't get sacked for buying IBM. We all know that. Um, and obviously, there is also pedigree. You know, we are a young company. We're only 20 years old. We've got 100 staff. You can't compete on an RFP versus a guide wire. And um, we come in at our price points. People don't trust it either. And also, we promise that we can go live in three months. People just go, are oh, you talking shit? Go away. <laughs> Uh, uh, also, they didn't have 120 million pounds to spend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Andre, hi. Also love Genesis. Um, how long does it take for you to onboard new products in comparison to normal policy admin systems? Um, we, we invested quite heavily about a year ago into building a zero-code product painter. We call it Build, ironically. Um, and with that product, we can onboard something, a simple single-line business, and take it live within about a week. Yeah, we'll be, I mean, we're, we, we, haven't, we didn't start specking renewals until October, I suppose, and we renewed our first policy in March. We haven't even started on the solo product, and, and that'll be, again, I would have thought, towards the summer before going live in October. Yeah. It works for us. And that's about a two-week spec we did for you. Yeah. One more question. Uh, hi, Matthew, this question for you. Um, so we've heard about the how and the what, but where's the why? Why, are you, why did you do this? What, what made you want to do this? Uh, 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 simple. Uh, personally, I got fed up with making other people rich. Um, uh, Business-wise, 95% of businesses in the UK don't buy any health insurance for their staff. So we're not fishing in a small pond. So it, it, we had to have a go. Good answer. Um, Matthew, Andre, thank you. Good story. Thanks a lot. So we have Sebastian Piquet from um, Descartes Underwriting, all the way from Paris. Uh, we thought we would have somebody from France here while we still can legally <laughs> travel between the countries. <laughs> Sebastian, uh, your turn. What do you think, uh, what's this, what does Descartes Underwriting do? Tell me the story. So we develop a new insurance product uh, on behalf of different uh, risk carriers. Uh, we cover all natural uh, hazards, and to do so, we leverage uh, new data sources from satellite images to all IoT devices. Nice. Um, and so, what classes are you doing now, and, and what classes do you intend to do? I mean, we have no constraints. I mean, we, we have we among clients we have uh, companies operating in the energy sectors, in the agriculture sector in many different uh, sectors, uh, basically all companies which are weather sensitive. Um, so our only constraints is that we have to cover natural, natural hazards. Um, so uh, ha that, that sounds complicated from a tech perspective. Who built the tech? How did you set about? So data is very important for us. First, to improve the customer experience. So we settle the claims automatically based on data. Uh, data is also important for us to uh, ensure new risks. We do a lot of uh, NDBI uh, to cover risks that, uh, for which, that traditional insurers are not able to cover. Uh, the last part is that we leverage data to have cutting edge models. Uh, basically, through parametric insurance, we avoid fraud risks. Um, we have access to a very large 
uh, amount of data to improve our pricing, and we develop uh, physical models as opposed to statistical models. So we uh, model the underlying uh, risks, so the temperature, the precipitation, and we build a model to have a better understanding of the risk that we underwrite. Uh, in terms of technologies, uh, our platform is, in, uh, is, is coded in, in Python, and it is developed by our team of data scientists and meteorologists. So, uh, w would I call that parametric? What, what, which of your products is parametric, or are you parametric by, uh, depending on what the requirements of the, um, uh, the customer are? You, sort of mean, are you, you said you, you have automatic claims payments. Is that always automatic or sometimes automatic? Yes, as soon as we uh, receive the data, uh, we are able to set up the claims. Cool. Um, so I was going to ask you uh, what makes you special, but I, <laughs> I've just worked it out for myself. Um, <laughs> what, are, what are the data sets? Wh wh how do you, I mean, I don't tell everyone where you get your special data, but, but I mean, are they they're publicly available data sets? How did you set about getting them? Yes, yeah, so we use a lot of data from the NASA and uh, from the European Space Agency. So, for instance, uh, I mean, so there are already plenty of uh, data sets available for free, but we we'll use also uh, data from weather stations, from buoys, from uh, gauges to measure water levels, for instance. So, as soon as we have a reliable uh, data set, we are able to leverage it to uh, cover new risks. If I don't ask this and someone else is going to, what's the distribution model? So we fully rely on brokers. That's very important Thank you for asking this question because for us it's very important. Uh, we want to build a sustainable and a strong relationships with brokers. Basically, uh, we are able to, based on the needs that uh, are collected by the brokers, we are able to, to design a new product uh, within one month, uh, sometime to be very responsive uh, and to partner with them to, to better answer the needs of their clients. And you haven't got a secret disintermediation strategy that you're going to tell us about? No, I mean, I think we, for us it's really two different businesses. Uh, we, we are technology uh, driven, we develop new models, uh, we propose new products, but uh, the relationship with the clients is better managed by brokers. Uh, we, cover, we are covering risks uh, in uh, over all continents, and basically uh, we we are not able, we will not be able, and it will not be our goal to basically to bypass the brokers as opposed to many different uh, large uh, risk carriers. And, and last one, is there, is there an insure tech scene in, in Paris? I see, uh, I think right now I've seen three or four really cool MGAs emerging from market in the last, you know, three to six months. Is there a sort of vibrant scene? Why, why, why suddenly all this cool stuff? Yeah, we saw a lot of, a lot of new startups uh, advance in uh, data analytics and data science. So I think that uh, it's uh, one of the main advantages of the Paris FinTech uh, ecosystem, I would say. Uh, but I'm very often in London to meet people from the London market. <laughs> okay, we've run out of time. We've probably got one or two questions. Anyone got a quick question for Sebastian? I was just wondering, when you talk about automatic claims payments, um, what happens in circumstances where the data is wrong or data has been, for example, hacked? How do you, how do you manage that risk? So we define fallback methodologies in our contract. So we have a way to automatically replace the data. Of course, it would take more time. Uh, so usually that's how we, we, we solve this, this kind of problem. It could be uh, uh, insurance against a drought. Uh, for farmers, it could be uh, insuring, uh, you know, a uh, fish farm against uh, a high wave, which will destroy it. It could be insur insuring uh, an hotel against uh, a hurricane. It could be also uh, an energy company against a warm winter. So everything which is related to weather. How do you help your customers decide what parameters to choose? Because obviously there's risk that they'll buy too much or too little cover and they may be unsophisticated. So we work closely with the brokers to, to, to propose something which is uh, relevant from start to the clients, and, but we design really bespoke covers. So usually it's a discussion with the brokers first and uh, with the clients uh, uh, afterwards. But it's only on a case-by-case -case basis, and, uh, but data, uh, I mean, 
We, we, we use also uh, historical losses uh, that if, if the client is, is willing to share them to calibrate uh, or cover and to design it in a, in a relevant way. Brilliant. Sebastian, thank you very much. Thanks to you. Thanks a lot. Next up, we have Richard Coleman, founder of Archipelago, a, a new insurance company providing coverage for home, motor, travel and pet. And he is joined by Justin Davis, who is the head of EMEA for Exceedance, who built the technology for Archipelago. Uh, we join them a couple of minutes into the discussion. How do you connect what you're doing to the brokers and how do they in turn link it into your, your end client? Uh, so we have a very, uh, we set out to build a very intermediary, intermediary friendly user experience, um, which the platform that Exceedance have built. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then we've really used our connections in the industry to start building out our own network of small brokers. Okay, and then, and then just given again, there's a competitive competition out there. How do you, how do you sort of market to the brokers? Or how do you incentivize the brokers to use you versus everybody else that's out Well, there? no one else is offering the breadth of product that we're offering. So it's actually incredibly hard outside of Chubb to go and buy that kind of package. We offer a very easy to transact way. Um, and um, people trust the expertise that we've got within our team. Great. Okay, so easy to use, breadth of coverage, uh, good tech we'll talk about in a minute from Justin, and, and your capacity provider is? Arch. Arch, okay. Fantastic. And so you found your first risk two weeks ago. How's yep. it been going since then? Oh, we're okay. I think we're going to be in double figures tomorrow. Fantastic. So, so ten times. <laughs> <laughs> you can order a magnitude increase in two yeah, weeks. Exactly. So if you yeah, keep going at that rate. On a weekly do. basis is on a good curve. Well, well done. There's a tough market out there. Um, okay, so Justin, Exceedance got involved in, in, building the, in building the tech. I mean, it'd be kind of interesting, first of all, just to know about how did, how did the two of you or the two organizations get together in the, uh, in the first place? So, um, so we've known Richard and Angus for a very long time. We, we do a lot of work with Aon, both ACT and uh, GBC. So we met these guys there. Um, and actually, they had an idea for... Uh, for the MGA a long time ago. I mean, I've got the original NDA, which goes <laughs> back to something like 2015. Yeah. Um, but we, because, we, because we've known these guys a long time and they, they showed us their business plan, you know, we, we believe in them as people. We believe in the business plan. Um, you know, we were able to offer a true partnership model. So it's um, similar to what one of the gentlemen was talking about earlier, where it's, where it's as a, a percentage of in fact, it's earned revenue rather than GWP, so it's slightly different. Um, but that means you have to believe in the organisation. You know, we're very pleased about the, the double figures because ultimately that means we get more revenue. Happy days. And as you made just Richard, a quick word about when you found your capacity, how, how, how difficult was that? Because that seems to be a big challenge for people is actually to convince people to put up capacity for their MGAs. Well, I think we, um, we were lucky in that our current, the jobs we had at Aon gave us some very, very senior market contacts and therefore we were able to kind of engage at discussions at sort of CEO level rather than sort of at individual product line underwriting level. Okay. We also had some additional distribution that we can't talk about. It's not completely signed yet, but that was very powerful. Good. We always love the stuff you can't talk about because it, you know, it keeps the story moving and creates yeah. some anticipation. But, so but I so guess the more you can't talk about it, the better, actually. Yeah, so I mean, I, but I, probably we've been very lucky in that a whole number of organisations decided that they backed us as individuals, really. So in the same way, Exceedance um, have been extraordinarily um, supportive in the way they've worked with us. Arch have been, you know, made a decision that they really trusted our, our management team to execute for them. Okay. They were looking for a a way of getting into the UK personal line space, but didn't really just want to wade into the, the kind of current melee. So they wanted a very differentiated offering. Right. So you've got, yeah, so the key part of the, I guess, the MGA model is you need the capacity and then you need the tech, which is where Exceedance come in. Um, Justin, can you just talk a little bit about Exceedance? You know, what are you looking for now? You've got this partnership with Archipelago. Uh, is that an unusual arrangement or are you starting to sort of see more companies you want to partner with? And when you say partner, what does that can you talk a little bit more about what that means? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we are, we are absolutely looking for more companies to partner with. We're looking for more companies who want MGA platforms, clearly. And actually, as a result of what we've been doing with Archipelago, we've seen two companies who've approached us and said, you know, we like what, you, what we see so far. 
Um, and whilst we can't really show them the full archipelago platform, because they might be seen as competitive, um, we can certainly show them something similar that we've done actually out in uh, Australia. Um, I've got another company who I was talking to a year and a half ago that's sort of resurrected the conversation. But we are also looking for companies that we might be, uh, that might be open to investment. Um, so our founder is a guy called Rune Balakrishnan, who's a real proper entrepreneur. Um, you know, and in the same way, we've kind of invested in Archipelago yeah. because it's a huge risk for us. And actually, we, we, you know, it's a loss-making proposition to us for a long time. But slightly differently, we're also looking to invest in an MGA. Or so, okay, great. So no pressure, Richard. Loss-making loss for some time. So, Richard, one thing uh, that you've learned from this that you would use to give advice to anybody else looking at you're developing a partnership with their, their technology provider? If you've got a good idea, don't quit your job until you are absolutely ready to go. <laughs> so my co-founder and I spent three years with, on someone else's pay developing the idea until we were ready to go. So always assume it's going to take longer and cost more money than you think. So if you can do it in the evenings and the weekends, then that actually gives you a huge amount of advantage over it. Okay. Jumping at the right time. Um, it's about trust. Um, you know, there are six of us in our business. None of us come from a technology background. Only one of us comes from a personal lines background. We entrusted the success of our business to Exceedance. Um, if we'd have had someone in their office at all times, or they'd have been in our office, i.e., we'd been face to face at all points, we could have reduced the build time by a couple of months. So I think that's an important lesson. Okay, I think we've got time for one, one or two questions from the audience. Uh, thank you, and, and probably directed on the, the tech side. H have you spent, I mean, it's a bit of peeling like an onion, the solutions around payment, remittance, uh, the user experience. Is, is, is that an all-in-one tech solution? And um, how long did it take you to sort of get clarity on that, that solution and bring it to market? Um, so I think the user experience was pretty much driven by these guys. Um, you know, they, they understood what question sets they wanted and that's part of their IP. Um, and on the payment side, that's pretty simple nowadays. You find the right direct debit supplier and you just API it. I mean, it's relatively simple. But yeah, it is part of the whole solution. Okay, yeah. and then one I mean, final question. Yeah, sorry. thanks Justin. Yeah, sorry for uh, Justin. I don't know if you said this, but how long was the build? And where you said uh, it'd be better if we were face to face, what what kind of cost implications would have had would that have had for a startup? Was that really viable? Yeah, you can. Have, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think this is the thing about you need to raise enough money to do it properly. So. Um, if we'd have, we had a lot of, so we, a lot of, we spent quite a lot of time in Delhi with the guys from Exceedance. We had them over a lot as well. So probably 50% of the build time, maybe we've had people from one camp in the other one's camp, I don't think, in the aggregate. Um, it would have probably, to have done it for the whole build would have probably cost an extra 50,000. But that for us would have been significantly outweighed by getting to market with eight weeks quicker. Great. Okay, Richard, Justin, thank you very much.